Christians today, uh, but uh, there will be bits and pieces if you're our guest today, you're not a Christian yet, uh, I'm sure you can also learn something, and there will be things that, uh, that hopefully will also stir and move your heart and mind as well. You know, these disciples who preached the word wherever they went, it makes a question, ask, make me ask the question, how did they do that? You know, who were they? And if I go and look and read, I realize that they were ordinary people, just like me. And maybe some of you, mm. if you don't mind being called ordinary. <laughs> <laughs> maybe you're exceptional, then they're not like you. But uh, they were ordinary people. And they were, were in November, towards the end of the year, and if this was the, the theme, for your theme for the year, maybe you've heard a lot about it. And maybe you will hear nothing new today. And that's okay, the Bible is 2,000 years old, it's not new. And... All we're actually doing is just reminders to help us to keep on track, to stay focused, and to reach the goal of our faith. So what is the story of the, of the book of Acts, where we read this, this book in the Bible called Acts? It's a story, but it is history. It is very accurate history. Uh, but is that all it is? Is it a blueprint, as some claim it to be? It's a blueprint for your life as a Christian, or it's a blueprint for how the church must be. The book itself doesn't claim to be a blueprint. I read it and I realize it's a story of people and places. Loads of people. We read names like Peter, John, Paul. Well-known names. Lesser-known names like Barnabas, Lydia, Felix, Festus. Loads of people. Different kinds of people. It's like Harry Potter. There's even a sorcerer in there. <laughs> there are beggars. There's a jailer. A soldier, a centurion, a governor, a tax collector, fishermen, all kinds of people from all kinds of nations, Jews, Greeks, Romans, Parthians, Medes, Cretans, from which we have an expression that's even used in English today. We read about different places, well-known places like Jerusalem, Ethiopia, lesser-known places like Straight Street. <laughs> even the street names are in there. Places like temples, synagogues, houses where people live, prisons, ships, boats, rivers. It's a bit like reading it. It's a bit like someone else's story after they come back from a trip or a holiday. And I want to tell you all about it. And then inviting people over to come and see your photos. Or, oh, hang on. We don't do that anymore, do we? <laughs> Anybody under 30 here have no idea what I'm talking about? Um, in the old days, back in the day, before digital photos and Instagram and Facebook, mm -hmm. what we used to do is we go on a trip and we take our photos and you come home and then you do photos not like a digital camera with, with film. You have no idea what they look like. And then you come home and you go and you get them developed and printed. And then you open the envelope and you're like, oh, I can't wait to see my photos. And you go through your photos and you put them in an album. And then you invite your friends over to come and see what your holiday was like. And then you get the invitation like, oh, I really want to go and see their holiday photos. <laughs> but you know, it comes with dinner and wine and some good fellowship. And, uh, okay. So you say, OK, I'll go anyway. I'll go, and, I'll go and sit through your photos. Yeah. Nowadays, you don't suffer the embarrassment of maybe declining the invitation because you don't really want to see their holiday. You can just mute the feed or unfriend them for a while and then refriend them later. <laughs> Without any feeling of uh, embarrassment, maybe some guilt, but uh, we can deal with that. But, but that's the book of Acts. It's the story of people's lives and travels and people like Paul and, and different places that he traveled and went to and people that he met. And all these events happened 2,000 years ago. The whole book of Acts spans about 32 years. And I think about it and I think I've only been a Christian for about 24 years. And I think about, what will my story and your story look like after 32 years of your Christian life? Will it be filled with memorable people and places like the book of Acts? And what will those memories be like? And when we read the book of Acts, and when you read it again, I want to encourage you to think about, this is not just their story. It is not just history. But it is our story. It is my story. It is your story. 
So let's go back. You know, when we think about stories like this, it's good to remember where it started. Remember where, as a Christian, where you started. Jesus appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. And in Acts 1, verse 7, he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the beginning of our story. And if you're a Christian, it's the beginning of your story, it's the beginning of my story. The story where Jesus says, you know what, wherever life takes you, whatever happens, you have no idea what's going to happen in your life. You may go to places that you've never been to or never expected to go. And then he says, but whatever happens, stay focused on the mission. Because you will be my witness. And that's mostly what I want to talk about today. He's talking about staying focused on your mission. Are there any football fans here? Football oh, like in oh. soccer? <laughs> Very few. Oh, it sounds like I'm in good company. I'm, I thought like, okay, many people are going to raise their hands and I'm the only one not, but I'm <laughs> safe then. So, so we're going to watch a little video clip um, of something that, an event that happened during the Football World Cup with uh, a group of men watching, I'm not sure which game it was in the World Cup, it was something like quarterfinal or semi-final, and there was a penalty shootout, and it was at that moment. So if you can't relate to football, you know, just imagine, like if you're Malcolm, imagine it's the fifth test of the Ashes. You level at two games each. It's day five of the deciding test. Any other cricket lovers in here? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, a few more who can relate. I can relate to it. You know, it's day five of the deciding test. The last session, light is fading. England is ever so close to victory, and you're sitting there watching this moment. Or maybe you think, like, what is that all about? Maybe you're watching MasterChef. It's the last one, the last episode. They finished, they, they, they're close to finishing, they're ready for judging, and you're sitting there for the moment. Okay, who's going to be the Master Chef? Or maybe it's The Apprentice, and you're sitting there wondering, who's the last one who's going to get fired? It's that moment where you are nailed to your eyes are so nailed to the, to the screen. Or maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the big reveal on Love It or List It, and you just want to see how this new renovated house looks, or the big garden makeover, or whatever glues your eyes to that little screen. So these men are in a fire station, and uh, do we have sound? Sound is not that important, but... Uh, and, uh, and they're watching the Croatian team in the World Cup taking this penalty. Everybody's waiting for that moment, the penalty kick, and before he could take the penalty kick, an alarm goes off and these firemen have to rap, rush and go. Why? Because people needed saving. There was a fire somewhere. They were focused on their mission. And there was a temporary distraction and something that maybe took their attention away and it looked like they were all very focused on this moment. But that moment wasn't nearly as big as the mission that they were on, which is to go and save people's lives. You know, whatever life challenges we go through, whatever life challenges you may be going through, I'm going through a pretty challenging time in my life right now. Um, I'll share about that later in, if you want to talk to me in the fellowship. It's, uh, the details are not important. Uh, and this is not the first time in my life. All of us, when we face life challenges, when, when things are difficult, it is important as disciples that we remember there are people to be saved. 
that that is our life mission. And that is the story of all the people and the places in this book of Acts. It's not just the story of Paul going on his holidays to different islands, to the lovely island of uh, Crete, to the lovely island of Cyprus, all, you know, sunny holidays, uh, traveling with uh, whatever budget airline. <laughs> he, he, went, he went to those places in very challenging situations, in prison sometimes, in hunger, sometimes in beatings. But this whole story is a story of people and places to save or be saved. A quick run through uh, some scriptures here in Acts. I'm, just, I'm not going to read all of them in detail. But all of them talk about salvation. In Acts 2 it says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In verse 40, save yourselves. In verse 47, those who were being saved. These are, this is talking about thousands of people from all over the world gathered in Jerusalem. In uh, 4 verse 12, it talks about we must be saved. A paralyzed beggar in Jerusalem. In Acts 11, 14, you and your household will be saved. This is Cornelius, a centurion in Caesarea. In Acts 13, 26, this message of salvation has been sent. And in Acts 13, 47, uh, you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. This is in the synagogue, Paul, in the synagogue in Pisidian Antioch. In Acts 16, 17, a slave girl in Philippi shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Acts 16, 30, a jailer in Philippi. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Acts 28, 28. Paul, in jail, in Rome, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. You know, as we go about life, we also go to places. We meet people. It may not be Antioch, Jerusalem, Rome, all these places. It may not be in a jail. It may not be on a ship. We meet people. We go to places. And maybe you think about your life and think, where do I go? I don't know. It's just regular, boring, you know, the commute from... Home to work and back, and home to work and back, and then go do the grocery shopping. And, and we may think it's all just incidental or accidental or regular and boring. The story of the book of the Acts is that everything that God is in control of is actually deliberate and expected. Right in the beginning, when Jesus said, you will be my witnesses, he says, you know what, the times and the places are not for you to know. But know this, you will be my witnesses. I don't believe in coincidence that, oh, I happened to meet someone at this place. Guess who I bumped into? I only believe in God incidents. You know, in this whole story of where we go, the, the places we go, the people we meet, like in the story of Acts, as Christians, we can and we need to learn how to save people. And we can and need to get better at it. Maybe you're here today and you are not a Christian. Then please don't tune out. Then you are the one that actually needs to be saved. And that may sound strange to you, like what? Saved? Saved from what? Speak to the person who invited you and you will explain it from the Bible. What does it mean? We're going to look at some principles. I want to share some principles about how do we save people? How can we get better at saving people? But these principles, even if you're not a Christian, are actually very good. It will help you in life, in relationships, in your career, and so on. The first one is, I want to share with you, is five C's for saving. And those five C's are compelled, convinced, contact, connect, and courage. And they're kind of in sequence as well. Compelled. Compelled by what? Compelled by love. I'm going to mention a lot of scriptures. If you want the notes afterwards, you, you're welcome. I can email it to you. you can, I have one copy. You can take my copy. Um, but uh, if you want to, you're not going to keep up with me as I go through the different uh, chapters and verses. So I'll just mention it to you. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Paul says, For Christ's love compels us. For a ministry of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. That is the first step for us 
to have the heart to save people is we need to be and must be compelled by love. Yes, there's an element of obedience because there's an instruction that Jesus said, go and make disciples, go and baptize them, save them. But love and obedience go hand in hand like this. Obedience is motivated by love. Obedience is made easy by love. And obedience is not burdensome if we're compelled by love. It is very hard to live out the ministry of reconciliation if you're not doing it out of love. And if you're living for yourself. There was a rich young man who wanted to be saved. He went to Jesus and said, how can I be saved? And Jesus looked at him and loved him. Jesus loved the lost. And our love for Jesus must also result in a love for the lost. You know, if you're a Christian and you're baptized, you are here because someone loved you. I am here because someone loved me. And loved me enough to reach out to me and present the gospel to me. I am here because someone loved me enough to persevere with me. In fact, to persevere with me for... uh, more than a year. It's someone I worked with, and I went to, at the time I lived in a town called Pretoria in South Africa, and I had an hour commute to work, at least, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes two hours. I worked with him in Johannesburg. So I had this commute five days a week. He invited me to church in Johannesburg. I went once, I said, look, I do this commute five days a week. I'm not gonna do it (laughs) another day during the week. I went once, I loved it, I said, Thank you, I enjoyed it, but it's too far. But I'm going to move closer, and when I move closer, maybe I'll come again. So uh, we kind of, we moved on to different projects, and about a year later, about nine, ten months later, I actually moved closer. And I moved to Saturday, during the day, Saturday evening, I get a phone call from him. He says, hey, Stefan, how are you doing? He says, oh, Alex, yeah, just moved today. He says, I know, I remember, that's why I'm calling. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He says, remember you said when you move closely, you'll come to church again? I was like, really? That was like in 10 months ago. <laughs> he loved me enough to remember. And that started my journey to becoming a disciple, to get to know Jesus. You know, someone, in my case, Alex, he was willing to love me, to obey. He was... Compelled by love enough to deny himself, um, to persevere with me in a time when I was a completely different person. I was a complete introvert before I became a Christian. So we had a big project office where there were probably about, I don't know, 30 people in a big open plan office. After I became a disciple, I said, Alex, we need to share the gospel with all these other people in our office. And Alex said, no, I've already spoken to all of them. I'm like, what? All 30 of them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one's been to church. That one studied the Bible. I'm like, really? How did I miss that? It's like, and he says, well, you're always just in your corner, in front of your computer, not talking to anybody, in your own world. And I said, so when did that happen? I said, no, way before you came to church. I said, like, so hang on. How come I was lost? And he said, well, I thought, you are such an introvert, you will never become a Christian. <laughs> At least he was honest with me, but he did not give up on me, even though he thought that. He loved me enough to persevere. And we need to be compelled by love if we want to save people. Secondly, we need to be convinced. Convinced of what? Convinced of the message. In the same scripture in 2 Corinthians 5.14, he says, Because we are convinced that one died for all and he was raised again. We are convinced. That is why we share the gospel with people. Note, we must be convinced of the message, of what we believe in. And sometimes we lose that conviction. We think it's good for me, but maybe it's not so good for the people around me. We lose the conviction that people really need the gospel. And we need to be convinced that the message is for everybody, and it's good for everybody. Despite their resistance, despite their rejection, even when we're deceived by the apparent happiness, comfort, and joy of their lives, we do need to be convinced of our own message. 
Why? Because it's very hard to convince someone else of something that you do not believe in deeply yourself. And sometimes, you know, when we look at people's lives, we feel like, okay, let me just finish my Christian life and stay faithful and I'll be okay. Because I don't know about, I'm not so sure anymore of, you know, what the message is. We need to be convinced of the full gospel of Christ. I'll come back to that a bit more at the last point of courage. Once we are compelled by love, once we are convinced of the message, then the next thing is to just simply make contact. Contact with a soul. You know, that's what it says in Acts. The, the disciples, they preached the word everywhere they went. Contact with who? With people. Whether they believe or whether they don't believe. We do need to make contact with people. Without contact with people, there's no opportunity to give them a choice to believe or not to believe. Yeah. It is not up to us to prejudge who might be open, who might be receptive, who might not be. Because often we are surprised. Mm-hmm. As Alex was. Indeed. As uh, in March this year, uh, some in our family group was. We, uh, we went out on the streets in London as... As we do, some people thought, uh, when, I, when I moved to London, I said, hey, let's go and share our faith in the streets. And some people were like, what, do you still do that? I was like, well, that's what I see in the Bible, so I do it. So we went out on the street, we shared our faith, we talked to people about Jesus, and there was this one guy, Steve, that uh, Akin, who's Akin uh, Oyesolo, who's in my group, he met him, and invited him, and he said, uh, yeah, okay, I'll be there. And uh, afterwards, we, we met up and, you know, you share, like, who were the people that we met? So he was sharing about Steve. He said, oh, I met this guy called Steve. I said, oh, great, okay, what did he say? He said, he said I'll be there. He said, great, uh, did you get his number? He said, no, no, that's not necessary. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and I said, did you give him your number? He said, no, that's not necessary. I said, okay, uh, what does he know? He says, I, I told him where we meet and what time, and he said he'll be there. And we all looked at each other and we all laughed and said, oh, we, know, we know people like that. We know how that story ends. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Next, the next Sunday, he was there. He showed up. And six weeks later or two months later, he was baptized. We were all laughing about him. Without exception in the groups. Like, oh yeah, we've met guys like him before. Not open. He won't come. But we cannot prejudge people. If we love them, we give everybody the opportunity. And then we walk. It's as simple as that. We make contact and then we walk. And there's two ways you walk. Those who reject the message, you walk away from them. And you shake the dust off your feet. And those who accept the message, you walk with them. All the way to Jesus. It's all about people. We need to make contact with people. Where? Where do we meet people? Where do we make contact with people? Well, in places, all kinds of places. Where did the disciples in Acts make contact with people? If you read through Acts, in Acts 5, we see in the temple courts, we see from house to house, we see wherever they went, we see in the synagogues, we see in the marketplace, we see in the governor's palace, we see in jails. It is literally everywhere. As they were walking on the road, on a ship, on an island, around the fire, around the campfire. You know, as disciples, we cannot and we should not live our lives in boxes. When I've got my church box, and I've got my work box, and I've got my, if you're a parent with children, I've got my school box, where I go and meet the teachers and other parents, and I've got my sports club box, and my gym box, and, and they're all in separate boxes. And we don't mix them up. As disciples, we should have a heart that says, you know what? The gospel is for everyone, everywhere. And some of those situations are more challenging than others. To reach out to people and to share your faith. And with some of them, we need to train ourselves. You know, I started off as an introvert, not talking to people. I had to train myself just to talk to people. How would I do that? I would be somewhere, say in a shop, and I would just turn around in the queue at the cashier and say hello to the person behind me, or the person in front of me, and say, say something silly, you know what, oh, how are you doing, how's your shopping, oh, look at these prices, 
oh, you've got a good bargain there. How much was that? <laughs> Silly things, nothing to do with the gospel or with God, just to train myself to contact, to make contact with people. Just to get the confidence to talk to people that I don't know from anywhere. If we compel by love, those are the kinds of things we do so we can make contact with people. Yeah. So we can build relationships. But once we've made contact, then next we need to connect. Because contact is simply just breaking the ice. But to connect goes to the heart. Where we need to go beyond that first contact, the shallow talk about the weather and about football and cricket and rugby and school kids and uh, politics and whatever, Brexit and whatever other things people, people talk about. It means that we care about people. We take an interest in their lives. We connect with the heart and not just with a mind, not just with a person, a soul. Jesus connected in a great way with people, in an amazing way. He met a man with leprosy. He was moved with compassion. He reached out his hand and he touched the man, something that nobody ever did for that man because he was untouchable. We connect with people when we have compassion on them, when we have compassion on their life distress, when we take an interest in their lives, what's going on in your life, rather than what's the weather like tomorrow. We connect when we have social time with people. Jesus went and he had dinner at the tax collector's house, um, and he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. He was even accused of that. It's like, oh, this Jesus guy. Man, he's eating with those people? Prostitutes? Tax collectors? Greedy people? We connect when we have a social time, a meal and a drink together. It's amazing the impact it has on people's lives. There's a couple that came to church in the northwest region where we're from uh, a few months ago. They came along on a Sunday and some of them a couple of the disciples just invited them over for dinner. And we would probably think nothing of that as, uh, if, you're a, if you're a disciple. A few Sundays later, I had a chat to, to, uh, to, to, to the woman who came. And she said, you know what? She was so excited. She said, you know what? I went back to work that Monday. And I said, you, you, you won't know, you won't guess what happened to me this Sunday. I went to a new church. And guess what? I was invited to dinner on the very first Sunday. And then she said, and my colleague said, no, that can't be. <laughs> That's impossible. People don't do that. But they do, if they're disciples. And that's the heart of a disciple. So you know, when I open my home and I have you for a meal, that gives me an opportunity to connect with you. There's something special about food that brings us together that helps us to connect with people. To have a kind of a conversation that you, that you, that you cannot have in, a, in, a, in another way. And we see that throughout the, the book of Acts as well. Um, Aquila and Priscilla met a guy called Apollo, Apollos. And what did they do? They took, them, they took him back home with him, had dinner with him, and explained the gospel to him. And he became a disciple. We connect when we serve people. In Mark it says, even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom. Jesus connected with people because he served them. Because he was willing to go the extra mile, to go out of his way to serve people. When we connect with people, then we start conversations. And that is one of our biggest challenges, is to go beyond the simple superficial conversation and take it one step further. And that is where we need courage. Courage to tell the truth. Paul says in Acts 20, verse 20, he says, You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. Mm, wow. He hasn't hesitated. I hesitate often. I'm like, oh, I know this will be helpful, but it will also be painful because, you know, it will require some change and it will be uncomfortable and be challenging. And, ooh, how am I going to say that? And Paul says, I have not hesitated. That's one of my challenges. But you know what? We connect when we have the courage to go deeper. 
than just talking about the weather. When we talk about what is spiritually helpful, when we talk about what's really going on in people's lives, mm. not what we see on the out outside, not the Facebook pictures, the Facebook life where the sun always shines and it never rains and it's always perfect, but the real life that's behind that. We need to have the courage to tell the truth. When Peter preached in Acts 2, he pleaded with people to be saved. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.11, Paul says, Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord, we try to persuade others. Why do we need the courage to tell the truth? Because so much of the gospel nowadays is not the full gospel. We say the gospel is the good news. But the good news loses its power if we don't know what the bad news is. If you go to a doctor and he tells you, you know what? I think it's time we cut you open and take a piece of, slice a piece of you out. How about that? How, do you, how would you feel about that? And you will feel better afterwards. You're like, what? Why do you want to do that? He said, well, you've got cancer. And there's a big lump, a melanoma in you that we need to cut out. Now you've got the bad news. And you realize, wow, this is going to be good news that I'm going to be healed. Sometimes, you know, in Christianity today, unfortunately, the gospel has lost its power because it's sugar-coated with the sweet, loving, kind Jesus and God that loves everybody and that is so, so, so like a big bear that everybody just wants to hug. And the, one that, the God that will save you and will save everybody and you, need, you don't need to do anything but there's another side to the gospel. If you go and study your Bible, you'll see that the gospel consists of that good message, but also the message of judgment. The message of destruction in hell. And we need the courage to tell the people the truth about that. To tell them the truth that they are lost. Because why would you want to be saved if you don't even know that you're lost? If you don't know that you're lost, you think you're fine. And that's the important part of the gospel. That's why Paul says, we know what it is to fear the Lord. That's why we try to persuade others. And that takes courage. Yeah. It takes courage to speak up and persuade someone. Yeah. And to make that decision to say, you know what? <coughs> I'm going to say it because it's necessary to say it. In Thessalonians... Paul writes to them and he says, God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you. Now, if you're going through it, if you're being persecuted, that's kind of encouraging. It's like, don't worry, you know, big brother is staying there. Say, don't worry, I'll, I've got your back. And in verse 10 he says, and I will give relief to you who are troubled and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. He will punish those who do not know God. And do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction. And shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. This is a topic that is so much avoided in Christianity today. You can go and listen to YouTube sermons on all kinds of motivational talks. And all kinds of building things. And those are great. And we need them. But it's hard to find a sermon that just reminds people about the destruction that awaits those who disobey God. Yeah. It's not a popular message. And it needs courage to convey that part of the gospel, of the good news as well. Yeah. So these are five C's for saving people. We need to be compelled by love. We need to be convinced of the message. We need to make contact with people. And then we need to connect with them at a heart level. And then we need to have the courage to tell the truth. You know, there are different ways. I mentioned some of them. I'm going to very quickly go through this. Different ways to, six ways to make contact and connect with people. The first one is a simple invitation. The come and see invitation. In Acts 18, that's what Priscilla and Aquila, they met Apollos, they said... It says they invited him to their home and then explained to him the way of God more adequately. That's a way to start. The invitation to church. Will you come to church with me? It's a very simple, uh, easy invitation. It's not threatening. Uh, 
I spent six years in Amsterdam. It's an 80% atheist city. That kind of invitation does not work in Amsterdam. <laughs> you mentioned, will you come to church with me? And they're like, in church? Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. Um, yeah, I, the, the tourists normally go there. The, tour, uh, you know, the tourists that come to Amsterdam, they go and see the cathedrals and the churches. So that, that's, or, or if you say, will you come to church with me? The shutters come down because there's some mystery of bad experiences in the past or all the negative things in the press about church. To really connect with people, we need to go beyond that. We need to uh, do things like testimonial. Share your story. Share your own story. What is it that Jesus has done for you? That's what Paul did. In Acts 22, to a rowdy crowd in Jerusalem that wanted to stone him. When he was uh, taken before King Agrippa and the governor. Uh, he told his story. And he shared his testimony. And how do we do that? With gentleness and respect. And it's a very, it, it doesn't have to be a long story. It, should be a, it can be a very simple before and after story. Like in John 9, when the blind man was healed, and all the rabbis have said, Oh, what happened here? Who was this man? He said, I don't know. It's very simple. I was blind, now I see. <laughs> That's all I know. And I know this guy, Jesus, he did it. What is your story like? What would your testimony be like? What would your, how would you tell your story to someone that you just meet on the street? Just pick one word before and one word after. Like before my story. Before I, became a, before I met Jesus, I was selfish and arrogant. And afterwards, I learned to be loving and giving. It's a very simple testimony. But it's something that helps people to see that the gospel brings positive change. It can help you to be a better person. You know, we connect um, in our testimony when we switch the con learn to switch the conversation from casual to spiritual. Because once you've shared your story, it's so sim simple to then ask, you know, that's my spiritual journey. Tell me a bit about your spiritual journey. It's a very simple, open-ended question where doesn't matter if you're Hindu, Muslim, atheist, antichrist, Satanist, <laughs> you can tell your spiritual story. True. And tell you, oh yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a very non-threatening question to help people to switch from me and my story to you and your story. I talked about uh, serving uh, in community, in charity, at the personal level. Um, there's the interpersonal building relationships and friendships with people. That's a way to connect. Uh, there's the intellectual. That is reasoning with people, persuading them. Paul debated with people. He reasoned with them. He persuaded them. Some of this takes time. And repeated conversations. And for us not to give up on people. There's the confrontational approach. Which, if you look at the Bible, is mostly reserved for the religious. For those who claim to be the ones who know. So Jesus confronted the Pharisees. Peter and John confronted the Jewish council. Stephen, when he was before the Sanhedrin, uh, when, he, when he was called before the council, had a very confrontational conversation with them. He said, you stiff-necked people. Your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You who have received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. That is not the kind of conversation that you should have with 90% of the people you meet. <laughs> but there are those that need this kind of conversation. Where we sometimes do need to get confrontational with those who claim to be religious and claim to know God. Where they need to be shaken up a bit. Because sometimes it has an effect and it has an impact. There was a Pharisee, a member of the Jewish council called Nicodemus, who was shaken up by this type of confrontation and he became a, a disciple. These are six ways to make contact and connect with people. Now this is the story of Acts. We find this, if you go and read through the book of Acts, you'll find examples of, 
of all of this all through the book of Acts. Back to the people I know. People you may know. In my 24 years as a disciple, some people I knew for a very short time and then they became Christians. Some people took longer. And I want to encourage you to not give up hope. This there on the left is my brother. He's uh, two years younger than I am. So he's uh, 49. And his wife. Um, 24 years ago, when I became a Christian, I reached out to my brother. Unbeknownst to me, his, uh, his best friend at university, let's call it that, it was actually his drinking buddy, but uh, <laughs> his best friend at university became, also became a disciple in another part of the church, which I didn't know. I reached out to him. I said, will you come to church with me? I thought, well, you know, I've become a Christian. It's a great church. And he's like, what church is this? And I explained to him, but he said, is that the church that Adolf goes to? He's university friend. I said, yeah, I saw Adolf last, last Sunday. I couldn't believe it that he was also there. He's like, no, I'm not coming. Forget it. I will never come. That's 24 years ago. He was not interested. And he resisted and resisted and was never open to conversations, was not interested for 24 years. Uh, I'll make a long story very short. A year ago, he was baptized. Wow. After 24 years. Now, there are people you may know in your life and that you think I've known them for a long time, family members, maybe friends, like Malcolm's friend, that is his school friend, that is known for decades, and maybe you've given up on them. But there may be people you know in your life that just need time, and that need your faith and your love, and you're not giving up on them for them to be saved. There are places I go. Uh, that was in Namibia. We lived eight years in Namibia. And sometimes God sends you places and you think like, God, what is going on here? Uh, Namibia was wonderful. We loved it. Um, the place I'm talking about is actually a business. I got involved in a business venture with the man on the right there, up there. His name is uh, Tuobi, and next to him is his wife, Margaret. And uh, the picture at the right is the, where they get baptized together. Wow. I got involved in a business venture with him, which turned out to be a huge fraudulent scam. Uh, if you've heard of the Bernie Madoff thing in New York, in America, it's something to that extent and that scale. I, I basically lost my house uh, in the process. And you ask yourself the question, God, why? why am I getting involved in this? I should have hated him. I should have been very angry with him. And there were occasions where I were very angry with him. But when it ends there, then you think like, what? The money? I don't care. God sent me to do that place so someone can be saved. What places do God send you to? Where you think like, what am I doing here? This is not relevant to my Christian life. You won't know until you make the connection with the people who are there. And maybe God wants them to be saved. Now there's a song, people and places, people I know, places I go. Again, if you're my age, from the 90s, it's a Britpop song by a band called The Sundays. They were never really that big, but this one, this one that made it into the top 15 or something. Um, the song is called Here's Where the Story Ends and it starts off with these words People I know, places I go make me feel tongue-tied I can see how people look down they're on the inside Here's Where the Story Ends It's a sad song of someone that's trying to make contact to connect with people who feels like I look at them and they are hopeless, they're not interested, you know, they look down, nowadays it will be looking down at their <laughs> phones, um, and then they sing, well, here's where the story ends, because, you know, there's no connection, because they're on the inside. 
the writer of the song is on the inside, and those she's trying to connect to is on the inside as well. Whether you are on the inside or you're on the outside, don't let your story end there. Don't be like this where you say, here's where the story ends. Because the story doesn't end there. If you're not a Christian, your story is still being written. Start looking outside. There's a story that God wrote for you that's waiting for you. If you are a Christian, connect with those people because some of them will be part of your story. You know, when you read the book of Acts again, you read that story, don't just think about, oh, it's a story, it's a history, it's a story of other people and other places. I read it and I think, you know, that's my story. It's your story too. The book of Acts is a story about me and my God. It's an old story, but it's also a new story because it's alive in my life now and forever until I die. It's a story of why and how God called me, how He saved me, why and how He loves me. It's the story of everything I stand for, I believe in, I live for, I hope for, and will die for. And it's a story of God working through me to save others and to make lifelong friends. God is still writing my story of Acts. And I'm excited to be in His story with great people, interesting places. What will your story of Acts be like? There are people you know, there are places you go that should become part of you and other people's salvation story. Amen. Amen. Amen.